Good evening, everybody. It's Matt Bowles here, Maverick Investor Group, and welcome to a really exciting webinar. Uh, this is Bulletproof Asset Protection, where, why, and how to properly form LLCs for the best tax benefits and legal protection. We have Megan Hughes with us tonight, who I am extremely excited about. I'm going to introduce her in just a minute. Uh, you're going to get a very substantive uh, one-hour webinar tonight, which is going to be a presentation by Megan followed by your questions. Uh, what I want to do right now is some initial housekeeping items. So on your control panel, you have a couple things. Number one, you have a question box, uh, and that's where you are going to enter your personal questions for Megan at the end of the webinar. I would encourage you to wait towards the end because uh, we're probably going to cover a lot of your initial questions during the webinar. Uh, but at the end, that's where you can enter them in the question box. The other thing that you have is a hand icon on your control panel. And that allows you to raise your hand to respond to questions that we may ask. So, for example, let's try it out now. How many people on this webinar tonight uh, do not yet have uh, an LLC uh, or, or any kind of corporation? And you are... Uh, you're thinking about possibly starting an LLC, uh, but you haven't done it yet. You don't have your first LLC yet. Go ahead and raise your hands if that's you. Okay, so great. So that's so that's some people on the webinar tonight. Okay, go ahead and put your hands down. Uh, now let me ask it the other way. How many people on the webinar already have at least one LLC or corporation? Uh, and you're he, okay, and that's uh, a bunch of people uh, on the webinar tonight. Great, so we have a mix uh, of people, and this webinar is going to speak to both. Okay, so what I've asked Megan to do uh, is to speak both to people that don't yet have an LLC that need to properly set that up, form it, and make sure they do the right things, uh, and also people that already have entities set up uh, to give you the latest updates. Uh, both in terms of the law as well as the way that the law is being enforced, okay, by the IRS and so forth, because this always evolves and changes, and you want to be ahead of the game. So, um, with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Megan Hughes. I have known Megan for, I don't know, at, at least a couple years now, uh, and she is uh, she's an advisor to Maverick Investor Group. She is who, uh, you know. I turn to when I have questions about, uh, you know, business entity uh, setup, structuring, uh, and so forth. A lot of our clients as well that ask us questions, I refer them over to Megan. Uh, she is an incredible wealth of knowledge. She's been at this for 25 years uh, as an asset protection uh, specialist. She's worked as a paralegal. Uh, she's a best-selling author. Um, on business, uh, entity creation, structuring, maintenance, and so forth. Um, and she's the founder and owner of Smart Business Incorporation. So uh, you are really going to have, I think, a, a fantastic resources at your disposal tonight. And I would encourage you to take advantage of it, both in terms of the content that's going to be presented to you, but also uh, bring your own questions. Um, um, think about how what you learn tonight applies to your situation, whether you're an advanced person that has multiple entities or you're a beginner uh, and you're starting your first, uh, feel free to bring questions during the question period and take full advantage of Megan. She's a resource, uh, uh, a fantastic resource. She's here with us uh, for the hour tonight. And with that, uh, I'll bring her on. Megan, welcome. Hi, Matt. Thank you for having me on today. Um, you, you covered most of my background. I have worked in the legal field probably since the early 80s. Um, I've worked in Canada and in England, and for the last 12 years, I've been working in the U.S. I am a certified paralegal, and I've always concentrated on transactional securities and asset protection work. Uh, in 2003, I started my own company where I offer mostly business structuring and maintenance service. Now, during my career, I have worked with business owners from all spectrums. I've worked with public companies, multinational companies startups, investors, one-shot entrepreneurs, you name it, I've kind of come across it over the years. And what I've found in that time is that I've seen or I've had to repair an awful lot of, of bad documentation. And that helps to give me a really good perspective on how to properly set up and maintain an LLC. 
And that's what I want to share today with your listeners. I want to share how we plan and set up an LLC that's going to give you asset protection and some security in our excessively litigious society. Fantastic. You should have the uh, full controls of the uh, uh, screen and the slides there, Megan, to flip through. And I will let you uh, take it away and uh, dive into it. All right. Here we go. Okay. This is the legal stuff. So as with everything that, that I talk about in a public setting, everything I'm talking about here is in very general terms. Uh, they're not specific to any one person or one business's situation. Nothing I say can be taken as anything more than information. I'm not giving you formal legal or tax advice. might not even apply to your company. Um, and I always, always suggest that you check in with your own advisors before you put any plan into action just to make sure that it is, in fact, the right plan for you because sometimes it's very, very wrong. Um, so with that said, let me get on to, into the good stuff. First up, what is an LLC? So for those of you that you know, are familiar with this, okay, for those of you that this is new, here we go. When it comes to real estate, I am sure that you and your listeners have both heard, oh, form an LLC, form an LLC dozens of times. Everybody says it. But what I find in, in my world is that it often seems to stop there and you're never ever told why you should set up an LLC or how to set up an LLC. You know, for example, why do you set up an LLC and not a corporation? You know, and I don't hear about other factors such as what kind of an LLC you should form, what state you should put it in, how that LLC, what tax election you should be making, and how to make sure that your LLC document can even withstand a legal challenge. And so those are the main points that I want to touch on today. So first up, let me get the basics out of the way. An LLC is a protected legal structure. It's a hybrid structure, so it combines elements of a corporation with elements of a partnership. First came into being in the United States in Wyoming in 1973 and has exploded since then in popularity. Today, LLCs are hands down the most frequently formed entities in just about every state in the country. Now, unlike a corporation, an LLC can structure itself so it can have an active management level and a passive shareholder owner level. We call that type of an LLC, we call that a manager managed LLC. But an LLC can also structure itself to have a single level, a single level of management and ownership where everybody is expected to participate equally. And that's called a member managed LLC. Um, and that is certainly one of the areas that I see people, that's one of the areas of confusion that I always see. Now, we call it a protected entity because it's giving you, as the LLC owner, some legal protection and separation from the business. And that goes both ways. Now, your protection is coming from state law. And so that's my first tip to you is that state laws are different. They're not all the same. And some states have got a lot better protection than others. But generally, you know, if you're sued personally, the assets and the business operations that you hold in an LLC are safe from that personal lawsuit. And likewise, if your LLC is sued, your personal assets and your other business dealings can't usually be named in the lawsuit, which is not to say that you can never be sued. For example, if you personally guaranteed a loan in the name of the LLC, you backed it up with a personal guarantee and your LLC defaulted on the loan, then whatever you put up as collateral could be at risk. Or when you know, if you were using the LLC to do something illegal, you could find yourself as a manager, as a member, named in that lawsuit if you were involved in it. Um, some other really common ways to blow your legal protections are letting your LLC lapse because you haven't filed annual reports. Um, or maybe you mix up your personal and your business dealings. I've seen that where people start paying their mortgage out of the company bank account and just kind of get lazy and start mixing up your money. All of these things are held up as evidence that you don't really have an LLC and so therefore you're not entitled to the protection. But I will say that in general terms, if you do what you're supposed to do, your asset protection is usually going to go or to hold up. Moving to the next one. So LLCs, as I said, they've either got two or three elements. They can have all members and just be a flat member or managed LLC. And members are the people that own the LLC. They all have interests, and that's the, the LLC's version of shares, so we call those member interests. And in some cases, your LLC will also have managers. 
Now, when an LLC is formed as member managed, like I said, everybody is expected to participate equally. Sometimes I think that that's really impractical. I mean, honestly, as soon as you've got more than three or four members, I think that becomes impractical. Because what you've got is a situation where you can have three or four people separately writing checks, signing deals, doing things in the name of the LLC, and each one of those people has the legal authority to bind it. I think that would be pretty crazy. So typically when I'm structuring something, if I'm looking at a member managed LLC, I only want to see one or two members. Um, or if I do have a bunch and people insist they want to be member managed, then maybe we just nominate a couple of people to be what they call the managing members, which I know gets kind of turned around a big circular language. But we nominate a couple of people to kind of do the day-to-day -day business for the rest of them. Now, if that sounds a little messy and you'd want an LLC maybe with a little more structure, then I think a manager-managed LLC works better. Now, this is the LLC that creates two tiers in the same way that you've got officers and directors in a corporation and shareholders. In the case of the manager-managed LLC, that officer-director role is taken on by the managers. That means that they are the only ones who are going to sign checks, look after the business, enter into deals. The members assume a position like a shareholder, and they've got a passive background role. Personally, that's my favorite way to set it up, with some caveats that I'll get at later. Now, your ownership in an LLC is called an interest. You can use the word share, but when you use that around legal and tax people, they get confused because when you say share, we always think of corporations. We don't think of LLCs. So, you know, if you can, try to use the words that we do, managers, members, and member interests when you're referring to the various elements in your LLC. One thing when you're setting it up, interests can be shown either as a fixed number so, for example, you decide when you set up your LLC that it can have a total of 10,000 interests. Or you can just show it as a percentage. Personally, I'm a big fan of the percentage method because I've got way more flexibility to switch my ownership around. If I set a hard number, if I said, okay, I, this, this LLC will have 10,000 interests and I've given them all out or I've sold them all, I can't bring anybody on board without making a, a mess out of my documents and having to redo a lot of stuff. With a percentage method, it's a lot easier for me to shuffle around, bring somebody in, and everybody's percentage just gets a little diluted as we come in. So I'm definitely a fan of the percentage method. So that's my three elements. I want to move on to why we actually use an LLC instead of a corporation in the first place. And there are two reasons. One is legal protection. One is tax flexibility. And I think they're both equally important. When you've got a, a corporation, you are stuck with corporate law. And those are not the same as LLC laws, particularly where your asset protection is concerned. When you're sued, again, your shares in a corporation, and, and through that, all of your assets in that corporation are potentially at risk. Shares are not protected from a lawsuit. But your interests in an LLC, those are protected. And that one small thing can make a world of difference in a lawsuit. And if, if that one small thing, which I don't think is small, I think it's huge, if that's not enough by itself, the next one up is tax flexibility. An LLC is the only structure that can pick its tax classification. So depending on your situation, even with real estate, you're going to have several options. For example, are you a short-term hold? Are you a flipper? Are you a developer? Do you operate a hotel or a motel? You know, all of you have got different tax needs from somebody who is either buying a second home or some rental real estate that they want to hold for a long time. Now with the LLC, you are able to choose the tax classification that works best for your income. And so when I stack those two things up together, I mean I always, 98% oh, of the time these days, I will recommend an LLC for my clients. Now here's five things that I want to see you do with your LLC. And I've got them set up here. Set up right, finish your paperwork, operate independently, follow the formalities, and keep it up to date. And I want to go through those one at a time. First up is set it up properly. Now, and, and the first step in setting it up is determining, as we would said, do you want a member managed or a manager managed structure? Do you want everybody sharing everything? Or do you want to create a divide between your management and your passive owners? You know, if you've got owners who don't want to be a part of the day-to-day -day business, or if you've got kids and you want to bring your kids in or give them some ownership, then you've got to have a manager-managed LLC. Otherwise, you're going to wind up with a situation where you've got, you're out of control. 
And I would say probably these days I am setting up, I would say probably 99.5% of the time, I'm working with this manager-managed LLC structure because I prefer the flexibility and, and the control that it allows the managers. But after you figure, oops, hey, I'm getting ahead of myself, hang on here. After you've figured out whether you want a member or a manager managed structure, your next step is figuring out where your LLC is going to be set up. Now, when I'm looking at that, I look at where your business is. If you're going to hold some property in Georgia, I'm probably going to set up your LLC in Georgia. If, on the other hand, you're going to hold property in seven or eight different states, then I might make a different choice and use either a Delaware or a Nevada series LLC. They're going to give me some more flexibility. Series LLCs are kind of like regular LLCs on growth hormones. And what you could do is you're able to create these little mini subsidiary under LLCs underneath your parent, and that gives you a whole bunch of different asset protection possibilities. I'm going to talk about the series LLC in a little more detail later on, but it, it's one that I get really excited about because it's so, so flexible. Um, other thing that I'm looking for is state law. For example, Okay, we've got some really big court cases, and they're fairly famous in the legal, the asset protection world, for Florida and Colorado that have really called our asset protection features into question. Um, if you're a single owner LLC in particular, this is important. If you are buying properties in either of the states of Colorado and Florida, and you are a one-person LLC, then I really might suggest that you use a state with better asset protection. I would probably say, you know, we'd start in, in Wyoming or Delaware or Nevada and then register your LLC into Florida or Colorado. And I'm doing that because I want to give you the ability to strengthen the legal standing of your LLCs. Um, both of these cases involved situations where the courts basically decided to, to overlook their own laws and bust through the asset protection shield because there was just one owner. So in those two cases, I'm, I'm looking for something a little bit more powerful in Florida and in Colorado these days. Now, once you've figured out your ownership structure and the state we're going to put it in, the next step is getting your articles filed with the state. Now, almost every state's going to have a resident agent requirement. The resident agent takes the function of a legal registered office. You can act personally for your LLC, but only if you live in the state where you're setting it up. If you don't live there, or if you don't want to be on the record as the named resident agent, then you're going to want to find a company or a service provider that will do that for you. That's one of the things that we do, for example. And then my last tip for you here is when you file your articles, watch the language. For example, this one just absolutely blew me away. Did you know in Hawaii, the LLC articles have a box on their form that you can check that will make you personally liable for all of the debts of your LLC. Why would you want to do that? I mean, part of the reason that you're creating this LLC is to give you asset protection in the first place. But I have amended multiple LLCs that were created in Hawaii where somebody didn't understand what that box meant and they checked it and made themselves, it just blew their whole asset protection apart. So it's, it's you know, set it up right. Those, those five things I come back to over and over and over again when I'm setting these up and thinking about them. My next one is, is completing the process of finishing your paperwork. For example, if your LLC is going to hold assets, you've got to actually transfer them into your LLC, otherwise it's not giving you any protection. And that's one that I've certainly seen with real estate. People forget that they haven't actually physically filed the transfer documents and re-recorded the deeds into their LLCs. But in some cases, that's also something that you need to put into your research ahead of time category. As real estate people, you already know that you've got a huge range of transfer taxes that either you or your clients are paying when you're buying property. But what you may not know is that there are a lot of states that will hit you again with those same transfer taxes to move property out of your personal name and into your LLC's name. Even though you might be the 100% owner of that LLC, from the state's perspective, you might as well be selling it to me. So if you're in a state with a big transfer tax, then a little planning will help. For example, maybe instead of taking title into your name in the first place and then flipping it into your LLC, take it directly into your LLC. Now you're only going to have one set of transfer tax costs to worry about. And depending on where you are, those can be substantial. I had a client 
um, who, who went sideways on one of those in, in, I think it was Pennsylvania, and wound up with a $5,000 bill that she wasn't expecting. So it's definitely something to take a look at ahead of time. You know, and, and having said that, I mean, not every time, this isn't going to work every time. There are times when to get the mortgage that you want, you're dealing with the bank, they're insisting that you take title in your name personally first. And if that happens, then it happens. But at least, you know, make that part of your, your to-do things is find out a budget for any additional taxes that are going to come after that to get it into your LLC. And next up is probably what I think is one of the most important things, preparing your operating agreement. Making sure that everybody signs it and making sure that it properly sets out how you and your partners are going to work together. Even if you've got a single owner LLC, I don't want to see you skimping on the details because single owner LLCs are already vulnerable. Like we said, in Florida and Colorado, the courts have already broken through them in a couple of cases. So I don't want to make it any easier by, by having you have a really substandard operating agreement that doesn't cover it. And that means things like making sure that you've got language in it that are going to deal with disputes so your LLC doesn't grind to a halt because you can't do anything. Um, I want to see language in there about death, divorce, disability, bankruptcy, incapacity, all of those things that can happen. You know, you can't protect the, the LLC from its owners if you don't have the right language in your agreement. You may find a situation where you know, maybe there's four of you involved in an LLC or two of you and you're married and one of you goes through a really horrible divorce, the other partner is potentially looking at a situation where, where an ex-spouse could, by virtue of what, what the divorce courts order, they could wind up as a part owner of this LLC and you're dealing with somebody that you don't want to deal with. You know, a properly drafted operating agreement can actually have language in there that would trigger a buyout or that can trigger protection for the LLC itself in the event that something bad is going to happen to one of its owners. And I'm going to rant for just a minute. Okay. When you don't have an operating agreement, you're doing two things. First of all, you're pretty much telling the IRS and any plaintiff attorneys out there that you're really not serious about your LLC. You are making it so much easier for them to break through your asset protection by not having it. And second, you're leaving yourself open to all kinds of issues between yourselves and your partners. You know, without having that agreement, if you get into a fight with your partners, all you've got to go by to resolve it is state law, and that doesn't cover everything. You stand a much higher chance of winding up in litigation, either because you don't have any framework together that deals with how you settle your fights, how somebody can withdraw, how you could maybe trigger a buyout and force somebody out. You know, litigation means legal fees. An operating agreement can also mean legal fees, but they're chances are they're going to be a lot less. Now, I recently had a, a, a almost client who told me that he didn't have an operating agreement for his LLC. He also was asking me about how to bring on a new partner who was going to get a really big junk, like a 40% part or so of his, in his LLC. And when I suggested that, well, the first thing I want to see you do is actually prep an operating agreement, I had sent him my questionnaire to fill out and Basically, he came back to me and he said it's too hard. He didn't want to do it. And he figured that his, him and his buddy, they're friends. They don't need to. They don't have to worry about it. But it's like being friends was the only thing that helped us to forestall lawsuits. Then why do we have prenuptial agreements? I mean, we, we, you know, you, you can go into something with the best of intentions, but life happens. So my last point on the subject of operating agreements is to make sure that you've got the right kind. I have seen agreements that are three or four pages long. I have seen agreements that are 50 or 60 pages. Somebody just asked me to look over an agreement they'd gotten that was over 150 pages. All of these things can be accurate or inaccurate, depending on your circumstances. For example, say you've got an LLC and you want it to be taxed as an S corporation, but your operating agreement was drafted to say that it was a partnership as far as taxes went. Whether your agreement's three pages long or 60 pages wrong, it's wrong. The language in it isn't right. And having the language in your operating agreement match your tax classification is really important to help to keep your asset protection going. I also want to see you operate independently. And what I mean here is I want to see you get your records set up so you're clearly showing that your LLC is operating independently of you. 
Now that means that your LLC needs its own bank account and it needs to keep separate accounting records that will track your income and your expenses. Do not, be, do not fall into the trap of rating your LLC for personal funds. Don't stick the ATM in, card into the bank machine because you're running late and you're in a hurry. Write yourself a distribution check out of the LLC if you need cash. If your LLC is being taxed as a C or an S corporation, then make sure that you've got a payroll set up and pay yourself on a regular basis. And always, always, always make sure that you're acting in the name of the LLC, not personally. So you want to make sure that you're always signing things in your capacity as the manager or as the managing member of your LLC, not just as, as John Doe. You've always got to make sure that you tell people, I'm signing John Doe, manager, ABC LLC. If you don't, you create confusion. And then legally, whenever there's confusion in a contract, it's usually resolved in favor of the person who did not write the contract. So if you're writing the deal and, and you don't sign it properly, it comes up into a fight or a litigation thing. When the court looks at it, the chances are they're going to rule in favor of the other guy because you drew, it up, you drew up the contract and you're supposed to know better. Another thing that I think is really important is making sure you've got your right tax selection made. If you want C or S corporation taxation, you've got to file notice with the IRS. They don't give it to you automatically. Now, they can grant it retroactively, and I have applied personally and gotten um, S corporation elections for LLCs that are maybe two years old. So you've got some wiggle room, but the IRS doesn't have to. And I've also had situations where I've asked for a retroactive election because the, the corporation election didn't get made on time, and they've said no, or they've only given it to me for one year when I was looking for two. You know, either way, it can wind up costing you money. But on the other hand, if you file on time, in all cases, this is rubber stamping. Your approval will be automatic if you file on time. It's only if you file late that you can have an issue, and it's only if you file after a year, so after your first tax return is in, that you can really have a problem. Next up, I want to see you following corporate formalities. Setting up your LLC is good. Keeping it maintained, on the other hand, is essential. And by that, I guess I'm looking, for example, have you renewed your resident agent service recently? Have you filed your annual report if you're in a state that makes you file one for LLCs? And have you filed tax returns or franchise tax returns that are needed? Now, unless you are acting personally as your LLC's registered agent or you've got a deal with a friend or somebody, then you can expect to pay a renewal on this every year. This is a paid service that, that my company provides and hundreds of other companies provide across the country. But if you haven't paid a renewal bill in a while, which you, know, you need to make sure that they're actually still acting for you. Because a resident agent is permitted by state law to resign at any point in time. And they don't necessarily have to tell you. you know, if, if they've been sending you bills or you've moved, you've lost addresses or you haven't been paying it, you, know, you might not have the protection that you're thinking of. And one of the things that happens there is when you're out of sync, if, if an agent resigns and you let that resignation go and you let your LLC sit in a position where it has no resident agent for more than 30 days, in most states that will bring you an automatic dissolution, which means at that point in time you don't even technically have an LLC at all. So again, if you haven't paid your resident agent service recently, go and check out your LLC online. Make sure that you're in good standing. Make sure that everything is up to date. Now, when it comes to annual reports, as I said, not every state has one. But probably, I would say over half of the states do have some type of an annual report. Um, sometimes annual reports are tied in with tax returns. We see that in Texas, for example. Uh, on the 15th of May every year now in Texas, you file something called your franchise tax report. And with it, you also submit something called your personal information report. And that pretty much it functions as an annual report, even though it's not going to the Secretary of State. You're telling them that, yeah, my LLC is still alive, and here are the people that are still involved in it. Um, other states, you know, California is one, for example. They'll, they want an annual report for a corporation every year, but for an LLC, they only want it every two years. And I think up until recently, New Mexico was doing something similar for that. Now, if you've got a paid resident agent service, then this should be a part of what they do for you. They should be monitoring your annual report, and they should be making sure that you're notified with lots and lots of time to get it filed. 
But when you're acting personally, then that renewal will be on your shoulders. So it's certainly something that, that I would recommend that you take a look at, get clear on when it's due for you, and make sure that you calendar that every year so it comes up and you're not caught off guard. And in terms of your taxes and your tax returns, whatever you file for your LLC is going to depend on that state. And you might have more than one. So for example, in Delaware, all LLCs file a franchise tax report every year. They all pay a $250, just a flat franchise fee. Now that's due whether or not your LLC ever made any money in Delaware. If your LLC also had taxable income, if you actually had rental real estate going in Delaware, then you might have a regular tax return that you'd be filing as well, depending on how it's taxed. If it's, you know, if it's disregarded, then it would be reporting on your personal return, but there would still be some more tax to pay. You wouldn't be done with just that, that $250 franchise tax. And that's one, again, that, that'll really get a lot, a lot of people confused. There's so much stuff involved with this. Trying to keep it all straight in your head will make you crazy. Um, keeping it up to date. You know, make sure, I want to see you keep your paperwork up to date. If you've got owners coming and going, then I want to see you've got documentation showing that, when they came in, when they left. If they were bought out, how much did you pay? Um, you know, if they left, if, if, if did you have to get a valuation done? You know, I want to see the details. You want to see it in your book. And if your operating agreement needs to change, make sure that it gets changed. You know, it's, it's really easy. It's not hard to amend an operating agreement. You actually could just write up on a separate piece of paper what sections you're changing and what the new language should be. Everybody signs that document, and then you staple it to your, to your existing operating agreement, and you're done. And now... You know, if, if you had to, to show your minute book, if it was called into question, you've got the proof that, yeah, we made these changes, even though our original operating agreement may not reflect the, the reality that we have right now. And the other thing is you've got to act quickly if something happens. If you've got a member getting into trouble, you know, and it looks like perhaps they're going to get sued or perhaps that somebody might try to take a run at their ownership, you know, make sure that you activate those buyout provisions. If, if it's looking like you've got a problem, you want to protect the structure at that point in time as opposed to necessarily the member has got their own, you know, they've, they've got their own issues to deal with, but you've still got the whole structure and your business and your assets and your investments to deal with. So don't, don't let it slip. You, you need to act quickly. You can always, you know, essentially buy somebody out and have them buy back in later. Um, I want to see you, as I'm talking my way through this, avoid, okay, these are my five killer mistakes. You can see them on the screen. No operating agreement, well, we've talked about that. A wrong operating agreement, we've talked about that one too. Um, your wrong tax classification, that one's going to cost you money. The wrong structure, if you're a real estate professional, that one can really cost you money. And an overly complicated structure can cost you money and, and can just make you a little crazy to boot. Now, in terms of the operating or the wrong operating agreement, I once got an email from a lawyer in Florida, and she's a litigator, and she was talking about how easy she thought it was to bust through an LLC's legal protection. And she said the first thing that she would ask for any time there was a dispute was a copy of the operating agreement, followed by asking about that LLC's tax classification. And what she would do is if the language on the operating agreement wasn't going to match the tax classification, she had the opportunity. She had the hole that she was looking for. And then she would use that as a target and say, look, these, these incorrect documents, this is a major reason why this LLC is really a sham. Shouldn't be allowed to protect the owners personally. They're just monkeying around. And this lawyer was training her entire office on how to pull apart LLC documents. So it was, it was like a shocking call, but it was a really good wake-up call, too. One of the things that, that you know, my office did when we got that email was make sure that we went back through all of our operating agreement samples and things that we use in standard language just to make sure that we had covered all of our bases for the various tax classifications and made sure that everything throughout the agreement matched. Now, what I find is that most of the time, if you're not familiar with why this is important or the fact that it exists at all, I see a lot of people will do things, they'll go on the internet, they'll look for an agreement, uh, they'll find one that's maybe designed for a single owner LLC or a two plus owner LLC, you know, and, and they figure, okay, this will work for me. But it won't, you know, in, in the case of an LLC that's looking for that S or that C corporation classification, it's not going to work. 
But you know, if you don't know that, or if you don't know what language you can looking for, you should be looking for, then you're vulnerable. It can. The other thing it's going to do, though, and I've seen this happen, is that it puts people into a false sense of security. They figure, I've got an operating agreement. It's signed. It's good. I'm ready to go. I'm protected. And then when they do get into a dispute, and their documentation is pulled apart, they find out that you know they've really been living under this false umbrella the whole time. You know, I mean that wrong tax classification. When I see that, I also see that one hurting your bottom line, and that's probably you know one of the biggest things that I see over and over again with people that form their own LLCs, making the wrong election. Now, I know that my partner Diane Kennedy comes on a lot. She talks all about the you know the tax side and how to make the elections and why you want to make these elections. I don't want to duplicate all of that, but I'm going to give you my little cliff note version. If you've got an LLC that sells a product or a service, you are an active income business and you probably need to be choosing either S corporation or C corporation taxation. On the other hand, if you've got an LLC that generates income through long-term real estate rentals or from a stock portfolio, you've got a passive income business you want to be looking for the passive taxation, so single owner disregarded or partnership. Now, if you buy and sell properties quickly, i.e. your property flipper, you're going to fall into that active income business category. If you're a real estate agent, you've got active business, you've got active income. If you're a real estate developer and you're putting up housing projects that you're selling off bit by bit, you're active. If you've got a business that rehabs or you paint or you do the driveways, you resurface, you do anything like that, any time that you're doing something, you're active. And if you've got a short-term business, a short-term rental, timeshares, motels, things like that, you're active again. You're not passive. And the reason for this is tax. You know, all of your active businesses, these are all subject to what we call self-employment tax. And that's your Medicare and your Social Security. That is going to add up and add 15% onto your tax bill. But we've got ways to minimize that hit and using the S or the C corporation taxation as a prime example. By moving into one of these tax brackets, for example, we can eliminate self-employment tax and we can replace that with a much, much lower payroll tax amount. Diane and I, this is one of our favorite ones. I mean, we save people. I don't know, we've saved people anywhere from like five to $50,000 just on that one thing. It, it's amazing how that wrong tax classification can hit your bottom line. So that is, again, that is my bottom line. If you've got income on your return that can be classified as active, and yet you're filing, your, your business is either filing on a Schedule E or on a Form 65, you'll want to get in touch with your CPA because you're probably paying too much. Okay, let me come on to the real estate professional mistake. And again, this is one I'm sure that Diane talks about. In fact, I know that I'm betting that most of you on this call know my partner, Diane. Um, you know, whenever you hear the saying, oh, you know, he or she wrote the book on a subject, I can apply that to Diane, at least as far as rental or real estate and taxes go. She's just brilliant with this. And where Diane's really knowledgeable is something called the real estate professional tax deduction. That's the deduction that lets you sidestep that IRS limitation on passive activity losses, and it lets you take all of your losses each year, even if you're taking them against active business income. This is a massive tax saver for those people who qualify, but not everybody does. And since 2008, the IRS has spent a fortune auditing this area really hard. We had a lot of fraud. We had a lot of abuse happening prior to that. And what the service wanted to do was put some new rules into place. The way they decided to do that was to begin this massive series of audits and see just how much they could make stick and kind of turn into de facto tax law just by, by succeeding on audit after audit after audit. One of the things that came out of these audits was a really new approach to this real estate professional and entities. At this point, here's my question. If you want to claim a real estate professional tax status, you have got to be actively working in your LLC. So, you know, a, a while back I was talking about how you choose between a manager managed and a member managed LLC. 
Well, if you want this real estate professional tax deduction, you must be named as a manager. Okay, if you are a passive member in that LLC, it won't work. If you've got an existing LLC that is set up that way, you've got to change it. You need to come on and make that change, become a manager. The IRS is absolutely looking for this one thing. It's in their own practice guides. And if they find it, if they find that you are making a claim as a real estate professional and yet you are not holding an active role in your business, you're, you're going to lose that deduction. You will lose it. They won't let it go. So in the operating agreement samples that I use when I'm using passive income real estate LLCs, what I do is I make sure that I've got some features and clauses in it. I drafted it with this in mind and, and what I wanted to do was to help people understand or actively be able to show the IRS, look, this was my intent. I'm an active participant. Here are the things that I'm doing for my LLC. So we actually added language in there that the IRS wants to see um, and, and you know, that, that will say things like, you know, I do this, I do that. These are things that are expected of a manager role in this business and I am a manager. This one is, is really big. Again, if, if, you're, if you're in either a partnership, an old limited partnership, and you're not the general partner, or if you are in an LLC where you are, it's a manager-managed LLC and you're not a manager, you've got a problem. If you're in a member-managed LLC, it might be a little more different. You might actually be okay there because, remember, that member-managed LLC Everybody is, is deemed to participate equally. But, you know, again, that, that comes with its own drawbacks if you've got a lot of members in that LLC. So ideally, I prefer to see that manager-managed structure with you named as a manager, and that really helps to make sure that you get that deduction and you've got your operating agreement language that's just going to match. Okay. I love this slide. Do you ever, does anybody else out there besides me remember playing Mousetrap? I loved it. I thought it was just a ball because I'm taking a simple thing and I'm making it as complicated as I possibly can. Love that game. But the other thing that I also noticed even as a kid is that, I don't know about you, but my mousetrap game never worked very well. Maybe it would take me like five times to make it work. So, all right, time for another story. I have a client who has, I don't know, I think they've got about a dozen structures. Now, I maintain all of them. They're in a couple of states. And what they've done with this is they've got their LLCs nested so that, uh, you know, they've got like two parent LLCs and a bunch of other LLCs underneath it. It's kind of like the series LLC in that aspect. They were sold this structure by a really big, famous firm. My clients pay in service fees, resident agent fees, state filing fees. This is before tax returns. Just in these things, they're probably paying about $8,000 a year. What makes me crazy is that I could get that number down to probably around $3,000 by streamlining their entity plan. And so when somebody approaches you or when they're looking at this big complicated structure, what I want you to ask is why? Why, why so complicated? Who's benefiting here? And is there a better way? Now for my client, I think they're getting a horrible deal. I've told them that. But, you know, the people who are filing their tax returns, they're doing great. And all of the states that are collecting all their LLC fees every year, they're doing great too. You Megan, know, you know, I mean, let me, Megan, I'll just jump in there because, you know, I, I've, you know, had a lot of these experiences uh, as well myself coming up. And, you know, I read all the asset protection books in terms of how you're supposed to do this to make sure you're well protected and all this kind of stuff. And then I approached, you know, the lawyers that originally set up, you know, a bunch of my entities and I asked them, you know, well, do you think that I should do this or do you think I should get a separate LLC for each single entity and I should do all this whole complicated thing? And they recommended to me the most complicated thing and it ended up just costing me a fortune, you know, to set up and then to maintain it. and eventually it just, you know, I ended up consolidating mm -hmm. it later on but lost a lot of money. And what you need to remember, you know, is that <laughs> lawyers are, are salespeople, right? I mean, they're, they're selling billable hours, they're selling you know, fees for entity creation and this kind of stuff as are, you know, as you said, you know, the CPAs are doing well, the lawyers are doing well, uh, and all this kind of stuff. So it, it's an important, uh, I think, line to walk where 
you are taking the right precautions and you're making sure uh, that uh, that everything is done properly so you're maximizing your asset protection, but you're also savvy enough to make sure that your operation is as lean and efficient as possible so you're not wildly overpaying for it. <laughs> I just wanted to emphasize that from my personal experience of mistakes in that area. Oh, I, I understand. And, you know, to be fair, um, we've gone through, business structures have changed. Even in you know, the, the, the 13, 12, 13 years that I've been in this country, I've watched a lot of changes in business structures. And I've watched a real movement away from limited partnerships, which used to be, depending on where you were at, that was the structure to use, was a limited partnership. But you know, as LLCs and LLC law has developed, it's really eclipsed limited partnership. And I think it actually gives you better asset protection, particularly for the people who are looking after it. We, we always had said if you've got a limited partnership, you want your general partner, for example, to be a corporation or another entity because there is liability associated with the general partner position. But the, the, the parallel position in an LLC does not have that same liability associated with it. So that was one of the reasons why people started to move over to the LLC because it was, it was easier, it was one less structure to maintain. You know, and the other thing with lawyers also is, in addition, yeah, they want to make fees. I mean, yes, we're, we're salespeople. We're all salespeople. We want to do, you know, what it takes. But at the same time, what they also don't want to have happen is for you to leave a hole or for them to leave a hole that somebody else exploits. And then you come back to them saying, hey, wait a minute. You told me to do this, and it didn't work, and now I'm going to sue you. Right. Exactly. So there, yeah. there's some, there's. Exactly. You know, you'll find with lawyers that you're always going to get the most conservative position because that's the safest position legally. And, right. you know, yeah, it's, it's going to probably cost more. I, that, that would be the bottom line. But I do think that there are better ways to do things now. I really, really do. Right. And, and that's why I like the whole presentation as you've put it together here, Megan, because it's like, you know, the, the first, you know, 80% of it right up until this slide you know, I was totally on top of that, you know, very early on. I read all the books and I wanted every single, you know, thing covered and I and then I just spent however much money they told me to spend and made it, you know, a three layer structure with this and all different state I mean, you know, it was just wildly overcomplicated and this don't get overly complicated was the final lesson that I learned. <laughs> it's like I crossed all my teeth and I doubted all my eyes, but nobody told me about this slide, you know. And so I think uh, I, I think it's a, it's an important part of it. So I just wanted to throw that in. I think it's a great uh, a great thing to include. Uh, well, did your mousetrap game like work when you were a kid? <laughs> mine, mine like half only half the time. Exactly. But, all right. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, why one of the things that we just said, you know, there are better ways to do things, and this is on my next slide. This is what I really want to take a few minutes to talk about, and that's the series LLC. I really think that it's got endless possibilities. I don't want to get into it too far because I'm looking at the time and I've already been, you know, yakking away, and honestly, it's something that I can and I have done full hours on, uh, so it would be something I'd absolutely love to come back and talk about it all by itself. But here's the short version. A series LLC is a structure which is legally permitted to set up subsidiary LLCs under the parent. Now, each subsidiary, which we call a cell, can have separate ownership and separate management. It can make a separate tax selection, and it can operate completely independently of the parent LLC. However, the structure only needs to maintain the parent with the state. So that's one LLC annual report fee and one resident agent fee, no matter how many cells you have underneath it. Now the beauty of the series LLC is that when you operate it properly, each one of your cells is given asset protection from every other cell and from the parent. So let's say you've got a dozen pieces of real estate. Okay, you could form, like your lawyer told you, 12 separate LLCs, pay 12 separate filing fees, 12 separate resident agent fees and try to remember when each one of the dates are due. Or you could set up one LLC with 12 cells, reduce your filing costs to that single LLC, and you might even get away with a single tax return depending on how you set it up. I mean, it, it's just it's mind-blowing the savings that you can see. Now, the structure came into place. It's about 14 years old now. started in Delaware. Um, it's now available. We got it in nine states. The newest one was Kansas. They just came online in July.
but even if you don't live in a state with a series LLC law, you can still use that structure in your home state simply by creating it in a good state where it's available and then bringing it home as a foreign LLC. You don't have to bring all the cells. They don't get registered anywhere. So you're just bringing your parent in, just like you would take an LLC from Georgia into Missouri or Tennessee or whatever. You know, I mean, are there ups and downs with the structure? There absolutely are. We've got a lot of legal questions still. It's only 14 years old. In legal terms, it's a baby. Um, you know, what happens in bankruptcy? What happens? What legal rights do the cells have? Can they operate independent? Can they move out of the main LLC and just go their own way and make themselves into a complete separate LLC? But we also have 14 years without any lawsuits busting them. And we also have draft IRS guidelines on how the LLC needs to be structured for taxes. And that one thing, those two things together, but in particular, those IRS regs, that goes a huge way towards establishing that series LLC as a legitimate tool. You know, I think back to, to when regular LLCs first came in. They came into the U.S. in 1973. And there were dozens of legal papers. You look back through the archives, you'll see people talking about them. It's like, it's never going to work. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't like it. I don't want to use it. I'm not telling my clients to do that. And yet, here we are today with more LLCs being formed than any other business structure and you know a stack of, of established case law that's probably six feet thick if you were to stack it up. So for me, as far as the series LLC goes, all of these things, I think, add up to really powerful incentive for people that want to use it. And it works for real estate investors. It works for business owners. It works for people that do both. I mean, I absolutely adore this structure, especially for real estate because of that protection. And just quickly, by the way, the states that you can do this in are Delaware, Iowa, Illinois, Nevada, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, and Kansas. Uh, we've also got a couple of little ones, um, District of Columbia and Wisconsin, which are kind of, sort of, they've got like part of the law, but not a lot of it. I probably, in either of those cases, I would probably elect to form it somewhere else and bring it into those states, even though they've got pieces of the framework. Um, like I think it's, it's District of Columbia, for example. You know, they've got the, the language that says, yes, you can create these different series, you can do this thing, but they've also got language in their law that says, well, the LLCs can't hold assets by themselves. So for me, I'd want to do something different on that one. Oh, my goodness. I have been talking and talking and talking. And I have probably bored some of you and overwhelmed more. So what I would like to do, actually, is to invite you to check out our product line at ustaxaid.com. What we've got is we've got a, probably four or five different LLC guides now that we've created over time. And these are all designed to let people structure and plan and form and maintain their own LLCs. Um, plus, I'm always available to help. You know, I help either through that or through Smart Business Incorporation. So what we've set up today is, is actually a bundle that works specifically for real estate investors. What I did was I combined three of our LLC products. We've got, I don't know, the picture's a little bit small, but the one on the left, that's a, the operation guide for LLCs with active businesses. This one has been specifically written from the perspective of people who will be making either an S or a C corporation election. We've got explanations on how things work, why they need to be this way, how to set it up. Uh, we give you templates that are specifically designed for this tax structure. So we make sure that your operating agreement has all the right language in it. Um, plus, we even walk you through the tax forms that you need to file to make either your S or your C corporation status. So we try to make this kind of as standalone as possible so that you can be a DIY person if you want, or you could come and have it done, but at least understand every step that somebody's going through. The one at the bottom is our specially written operation guide for LLCs with real estate investments. Now this one was written from the perspective either of a passive investor, so somebody who is investing for long-term profit. It's also got a lot of discussion in it about LLCs where you want to be a real estate professional. So coming back to that super valuable tax deduction again, um, that one, again, it's got tailored documents that, that will help to bolster your claim that, yes, I'm a real estate professional. My intent is to be classified as a professional. My documents match my intent. Here I am. You know, I'm doing it right. I'm doing what I should do. The third one of these projects is kind of our general one, and this is an operation guide for LLCs. 
um, it's, it's maybe a little more general. The, those two are quite tailored. And this one kind of walks the line in between them. And so it's got a little bit different information again. Um, as all of them, they've each got an ebook that's probably, I don't know, it's 100 odd pages long for each. So you're looking at 300 odd pages together. Um, each one of them probably has 30 separate documents. Everything's been done up in Word wherever possible. So you can manipulate these yourself. You know, put them on your computer, do what you got to do with them. And, you know, again, we're always around to ask questions, which is why what I also wanted to do with this is throw in some bonus coaching. And the coaching is really cool. This is something that Diane and I do twice a week, or twice a month, beg your pardon. We do live, like, half an hour, 30 to 40 minute calls, where basically we just invite anybody who's in the program, you got a question, call us up. You know, we're live, we're recording it, we make it available to everybody. So if it's really personal, you know, we might say, okay, we'll deal with this on a, on a more personal level and just give you kind of a general answer. But, you know, we get a ton of people showing up on these calls because they're figuring out that, hey, wait a minute, this is a really cool way to get my questions answered, and I don't have to pay very much to do it. So what I wanted to do was give you kind of an access, you know, you're picking up these three operations guides. Well, here's a way to use them, or here's a way to come and say, okay, well, how do I do this? Or I'm on page, you know, 63, and I don't understand this. And so it's kind of a little bonus add-on for you. So we created the offer. It's in our shop at ustaxaid.com forward slash shop, or I actually put that little bit.ly up there. Um, we, we're migrating our site over. Long story short, we got a couple of glitches on it, but if you go to the bit.ly address or if you go to ustaxaid.com forward slash shop and you want to look for the operation guide bundle, you'll see this. Uh, I think we're going to run it for probably about the next seven to ten days. It's an instant download, so as soon as you buy it, you get an email coming back to you with your links to get it. Um, and again, I'm always available to help you out. So with awesome. that, I think, man, I'm going to turn it back over to you and take awesome. questions and finish it up. That was great. I, I didn't want to want to jump in too much there because you were really you were really rolling, and that was a lot of fantastic substantive information. Uh, and I know people were uh, were taking notes fast and furiously, and uh, and all that. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, at this point, folks, we are about five minutes till the top of the hour. Um, so we're going to open up the questions. You can start typing in your questions. Um, for anybody that needs to jump off uh, the webinar, there is a survey that will pop up uh, at the end of the webinar when you jump off. And if you could just take two minutes and just give us uh, your very quick feedback on what you thought about this webinar, uh, that would be awesome. We are always trying to bring you uh, really good uh, content that adds value to you, your life, your business, your investments. Um, so if you could just give us a feedback uh, on how we did uh, tonight, that would be Awesome. So with that, um, let's go ahead and you can start typing your questions. And this for me is always the most valuable part, um, you know, of, of any of these events. Uh, when you have access to uh, experts and resources like Megan at your disposal and you can just ask them your personal questions, that's always for me the most valuable part. So feel free to type your questions into the box now and I will read them out to Megan. Okay, uh, Megan, first question. Uh, you mentioned that the LLC membership interests are protected during a lawsuit. Can you elaborate on how that works and if there's any protection uh, during a personal bankruptcy filing? Um, yeah, the, they're protected. There's a, a, when the LLC law was written, most states put something into place that didn't necessarily treat LLC interests as personal property in, in the classic sense. Um, shares in a corporation are considered personal property, an asset that can be seized by somebody and taken away from you. But we've got language pretty much in every state that specifically says in an LLC, your ownership in an LLC cannot be seized and taken away. And somebody cannot necessarily reach into that LLC and take the assets out of it. Um, this is protection that is given by state law. And, and what typically happens is anybody trying to sue you or sue an LLC or sue you to get at your interests in an LLC, the best that they can do usually is have something called a charging order, which is essentially like a garnishing order. They have the right to your share of the profits until that lawsuit is paid. So while, you know, you might get a distribution check, you know, maybe for $1,000 a month, for example, and that might be diverted to them for the, the period of time that, that that claim that they have against you is, is in active collection. 
but you know, and, and certainly in the good asset protection states or the, the really powerful ones like Wyoming, like Nevada, like Delaware, and a few others, that's as far as a creditor can go. They cannot ever apply to foreclose, you know, and, and bust through the LLC and say, well, you're not ever going to pay me back, so I'm going to up the ante and try to get this foreclosed on so I can break into your LLC. Um, having said that, that's where we've seen the problems come for the single owner LLCs. And the first case, you, you mentioned bankruptcy. That was one, the first one that happened in Colorado. We had a single owner LLC. She put all of her assets into the LLC, and then she declared bankruptcy. And she told the trustee, well, no, that's protected. That's in an LLC. You can't have that. And you know, the trustee's position was, well, wait a minute. If that was really true, then why wouldn't all of us, let's all form an LLC tomorrow. Let's all put our assets in it, and then let's stop paying our bills. Because we can all declare bankruptcy and keep all our stuff, right? You know, and the court just looked at that and said, no, I don't think so. That is just not in the public interest. Um, and in that case, they broke through it. They said, no, it's, we're not protecting this. What I thought was interesting on that one, though, is that one of the things the court did say was if, if there were multiple owners in that LLC, they might have ruled differently. And so that, again, that's why, you know, one of the knocks against single owner LLCs is that we've seen first Colorado and now Florida break through that legal protection and say, well, yeah, it's, it's there, but we're not going to apply it in this instance because, and that because is varied from, from case to case. Okay, great, thanks. The next question, Megan, uh, says, I would be interested in hearing a contrast in LLC strategy uh, between uh, your recommendation for an investor who might buy one to two uh, U.S. investment properties, say fifty to hundred thousand dollars each, versus an investor looking to buy five to ten U.S. properties, uh, in particular with regards to the costs. As I think many Australians here are signing up for very costly structures for very small U.S. investments. No, I. I this is why I really like that series LLC. Um, I am working with with different offshore groups and. We're making extensive use of the series LLC because it will allow you to take those five to ten properties and separate them out. So you could have an LLC that could have five or ten cells underneath it, and yet you've still got one tax return, one setup fee, and one maintenance fee. Now I do charge more to set up a series LLC, but I don't charge. You know, my cost to create a series LLC is only you know a few hundred dollars more than my cost to set up a regular LLC. And yet, you've got the framework there to grow that thing as big as you want. So, you know, the cost savings, that's what I want to do for the client that I was talking about. They're paying $8,000 a year for their dozen or so entities. If I could get them to come in to a series LLC, I could pull that cost down to under 3000 You know, even keeping all of their protections in place, doing everything exactly what it is. But, you know, in that case, they're, they're stuck and they don't want to move. But huge, huge tax savings in that situation. Please explore the series LLC in more detail. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, why would I want to import a Nevada series LLC to the state where I reside, i.e. California? Um, actually, I wouldn't suggest importing it into California because of the position that the Franchise Tax Board took, which was we will accept Nevada series LLCs with open arms and we will also ask that you voluntarily register every single one of your cells with the Franchise Tax Board and pay us $800 a pop. Um, <laughs> the reason why I would say bring a series LLC into another state would be if that state did not have series LLC law of its own. Um, but again, California would be the exception to that rule because of their position on the franchise tax. Okay. Uh, next question, Megan. If I have LLCs, can I subsequently put them into a series LLC? You can. Um, one of the things that we've done when we have consolidated structures for people is we've done what they call a merger. So I might create a series LLC, and it might have four different subsidiaries under it, for example. And what I'll do for the clients that want it is I might take, you know, they might have a, a I don't know, say it's a Missouri LLC. I might merge the, the Missouri LLC into a cell in this Delaware cell, series LLC that I've created. The Missouri LLC can continue, it won't continue, but the assets and the tax identity and everything will just move over into the series LLC, and then I am able to dissolve that Missouri LLC, I don't need it anymore. 
I've sucked all the guts out of it, you know, including its history and its tax selection. I sucked that into my series cell, and then I can let the shell of that Missouri LLC go. So now you've reduced your filing fees. Great. Do that. Boy, Diane and I did that. We had probably between us about 15 companies. And a few years ago, we looked at this and said, you know, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, physicians heal thyself. And so we, we created a series LLC, and we probably merged and rolled in probably about 15 other structures underneath it and took our, our filing fees. It's 450 bucks a piece in Nevada. Times that by 15, you know, we took that down to a single fee of $450 a year. That's great. Okay, next question. Megan, are you currently taking new clients? If so, how much do you charge to set up a new LLC? You know, it all depends on what we're doing. Yes, I am. Um, I think my email is up on this screen, and, and please feel free to kind of email me on that, and we can start a dialogue. Great. Okay, so the, the price for an LLC setup basically depends on uh, how they answer your questions about what they want in the operating agreement, how many it's people are everything. involved in the LLC, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fees are a little different. Regular LLCs to series LLCs differ. Um, right. No but no two states have the same state filing fee. Right. Um, you know, general, right. so it's, it's kind of hard to ballpark right. that. So you'll customize it. So, so anybody uh, that wants to uh, talk to Megan about that directly, uh, you can email her here, uh, Megan at smartbusinessincorporation.com, the uh, email that's on your screen right now, and uh, she can talk to you personally about your needs and give you a customized uh, quote on uh, working with her and using her services. Okay, uh, next question. If I live in a different state but incorporate in Nevada, will I have to have a bank account based in Nevada? No. No, you don't. Um, now, depending on where you're at, sometimes that can be a benefit. Um, Nevada has a very quiet, a very private, and a very closed banking system. Nevada doesn't like giving information to anybody. So oftentimes, and, and certainly what was the case for California, we would often suggest to California residents that were creating Nevada LLCs to come on over, just hop over the, the, the hill and set up their accounts here because Nevada doesn't share information with California. Um, what I have seen and, and what I'm concerned about is, you know, California, they, they've adopted new nexus laws probably at the beginning of last year, and they've gotten really aggressive on bringing foreign businesses that are owned by Californians into the state. So you might have a Missouri LLC that is running a piece of rental real estate in Missouri. This has nothing, the only thing that has to do with California is the fact that that's where you live. And yet, under California's new law that they brought in in 2011, they're saying, well, that's enough. That you created Nexus. We want you to register here in California and give us our $800 a year. Um, you know, that's a position that's under fire. But for that reason, I, I, I would want to keep, you know, if I was looking at that, I was looking for, for a lot of privacy, yeah, I'd go to Nevada for my bank account, but you absolutely do not have to. However, having said that, I've also found that other states will look at it and say, well, I'm not going to open up an account in Missouri for a Nevada LLC unless you also register that Nevada LLC into Missouri to do business. So that's kind of the flip side of it. All right. Oh, excuse me. Next question, um, <clears throat> will you help to maintain the LLC for, uh, for your clients? Uh, if they, I guess it's if I, if I start an LLC with you, you help me form the LLC, will you also maintain it for me? And if so, uh, how, much does that, how much do you charge for that for, for following all the corporate formalities? Sure, um, we do that for, for hundreds of clients. Yeah, that's a part of what our business does. We have a yearly resident agent service renewal rate and we will also, you know, make sure that we send out reminders to everybody of when their reports are due. If they want minutes, we'll help them do that. Um, you know, the fees on that, again, that, that will depend on the level of service that you want from us. Um, our minimum resident agent service is $125 a year. And annual reports, there's obviously fees that go along with filing them with the state, but we try to keep our, I, I don't like to charge an awful lot for, you know, the preparation fees or whatever, I usually try to keep that down to like $25, $35 in addition to whatever your filing fees are. It's not, you know, it's not something that's so complicated that, that you should be paying somebody $100 to fill out a one-page form. I, I just don't think that's good value. Okay, great. Next question. Is it hard to extend an LLC with a limited 
life in the operating agreement? Um, no, it's not. But what you'll probably need to do is if you have filed your LLC articles with a firm um, date where, where the LLC will expire, then what you'll need to do first is go back and amend your articles of organization to change that to, to give you either perpetual duration, um, which is standard, which means basically your LLC is alive until it's not, you know, rather than ones that have a specific lifetime and say this will end on July 31st, 2013. So once you amend the articles with the Secretary of State's office, amending your operating agreement, that's just an internal one page rated up. Uh, we've actually got that amendment form. That's one of the forms that's included in all three of those operation guides, how to actually amend your own agreement. So it's, it's real simple. Okay, great. Next question. If I create an LLC in Nevada, but my home state is California, do I have to pay taxes to both states? Well, Nevada doesn't have any state tax, so there's nothing to pay here. Um, California, again, has taken a, a position that even single-member LLCs, and they didn't used to do this. This is new in 2011. If you had a single-member LLC, so the LLC was filing probably a Schedule E on your personal return, they would turn a blind eye. They didn't really care where you set it up because there was nothing. The LLC wasn't filing a separate tax return. There was nothing to grab for. Now, um, the, the Franchise Tax Board has actually put out a, a pamphlet saying to Californians, hey, if you went to Nevada and set up your LLC, um, you know, we think you should register it to do business here because you live here. And that's a part of the, the nexus law that California slipped in at, at the beginning of 2011. So, you know, we'll, if you call up anybody at the Franchise Tax Board, they will tell you to register your LLC into California. Um, you know, whether you do that or not, it, there's, there's different ways to look at it. I think if you've got a single member LLC, you've got a lot of choices. It does not file. There's no tax return to key on. This is filing on your personal return. So I think you've still got some wiggle room on it. Great. Okay. Uh, we've still got a bunch more questions coming in. Are you, are you cool for uh, answering a few more questions, Megan? Yeah, I'd probably give you another maybe eight minutes and then eight I think minutes. I better run. All right, uh, we're gonna we're gonna rock out for the final eight minutes uh, of Megan's time. Appreciate everybody staying with us here. If you do have to jump off the webinar, just take two quick minutes and fill out that survey. Let us know how we did tonight, bringing you some uh, some some good content and some value. Yeah, I know I over talked. I no way, time. no way. We did awesome. We got eight minutes, so I'm gonna try to get through these. Here we go. You may have to uh, we may have to uh, uh, give some succinct answers, and we've got some fairly complicated questions coming up, so you'll uh, you'll be <laughs> okay. put to the test. All right, let me. Um, here we go. Are you working with setting up LLCs for Canadian real estate buyers? What kind of LLC setup would you recommend in that case? <laughs> I would recommend in no uncertain terms that Canadian buyers never, ever, 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 ever set up an LLC in the United States and do not use an unlimited liability company from Canada. You are in a special situation. Shoot me an email. I'll talk to you about that one privately. But Canadian investors, for everybody that's on the line, if you've got an LLC, you don't want it. Okay, the Canada-U.S. tax treaty will kill you um, because of how Canada views LLCs. They treat them as corporations, which means you're going to pay double tax, and by the time you get finished with income tax and dividend tax, you're looking at like 46 47% that you're going to lose. No and, LLCs for Canada. And Megan knows what she's talking about because she's from Canada, and she's worked in both Canada and the U.S. on this issue. So <laughs> she is very uniquely positioned to give you a highly specialized answer. So email her at at Megan at smartbusinessincorporation.com and she will uh, tell you more about that and work with you to get the best structure for you when buying in the U.S. if you're from Canada. Okay, next question. What would you recommend when an LLC will be owned by another LLC or a corporation? Cool. I think that's a great idea. Um, you've got an extra level of protection. Um, it's probably going to be in that situation you'll want to make your LLC manager managed. You'll want to have whoever the person is who's going to be controlling it. So if that's you, you'll be the manager, and your LLC or your corporation will be the owner. Um, okay. You'll probably talk to your CPA about how you'll tax it, because that, that is going to change up depending on what you're doing with it and, and what will benefit you. But you can absolutely do that, yeah. Great. Next question, why do you prefer Delaware or Nevada? You keep mentioning it a lot. Um, I prefer both of them because they are states that have exceptional asset protection. 
They have series LLC law, which Wyoming does not have. That's my third state. Um, they offer high levels of privacy, and they have extremely, like a, a very, very strong asset protection law that is written in your favor rather than the favor of the person trying to sue you. Awesome. Next question. Does this series LLC structure work with, say, one cell doing real estate investing and the other doing an air conditioning installation business under the yes. same parent as an example? Yes, absolutely. What I'd probably suggest is that the air conditioning business, because you're carrying on an active income business, we would probably make a separate tax election, either a C or an S corporation election there. So it would file its own tax return, whereas your passive income ones, I might structure them so that they all roll up onto a single return underneath your parent. Not okay. a problem. We do stuff like that all the time for our clients. So is, is each cell allowed to select its own tax selection? Yes, it absolutely is. Wow. Most of the time they'll want to. Sometimes it's to your benefit to, to have them kind of collapse together in a consolidated one, and that depends on the individual circumstances. Okay. Uh, do you have a 50-state grid that shows tax rates for personal com uh, LLC estates, uh, uh, LLC fees by state that can help investors in their state investment decisions uh, to go along with which are attractive markets to invest in? Uh, and, uh, I guess part of this is getting into what Maverick offers. I guess so. They're saying that Maverick kind of you know steers people in terms of what some of the most advantageous states are to buy real estate. Do you simultaneously have a state by state grid? I guess what you're saying, Megan, is that you you've already kind of done the analysis of the states. You don't need to have 50 states. You already know what the best ones are, and you've sort of got those uh, hammered down, right? Um. You know, I think it, yeah, I'm not sure that I totally understand the question. I have a grid in, I, in all three of the LLC products that talk through what the requirements are for each state and what your costs to set up and maintain an LLC would be. Perfect. Um, oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. So I think so that's, that's what, I think that's that's, what they're that's asking That's one for. part of it. If you're talking about, well, what's the best state from a tax perspective for me to go and look for real estate in, you know, I, I don't have that information. That, that's really going to be something specialized that will depend on everybody. Right. Okay. Great. Um, are there any restrictions for having a foreign national being a member interest or member manager in an LLC? Depends on your tax classification. You cannot have a foreign national involved in an LLC that is making an S corporation tax election. That is limited to people who live and file tax returns in the United States. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen, but you do have to file a U.S. tax return to be able to, to be involved with the S corporation status. Um, apart from that, there are, and again, this is probably a subject for another webinar for people that don't live in the U.S. and that are investing. Um, there are some tax things that are different for you. Uh, there are mandatory withholdings. For example, a lot of people hear about 30% mandatory foreign withholding. There are ways around that depending on what you want to do, but it's kind of, again, it's a subject that we've got to cover in a separate one because it's, it's complicated. Yep. Okay. And, and any of these questions, either this question or the uh, the previous one about states, you know, selecting your state to start your LLC in and stuff, feel free to uh, email Megan uh, at this uh, email address, so you know, and she can either get you the information or tell you which product has the grid and the information in it, so you can uh, you can buy the right product and so forth. So just feel free to contact her. Uh, as our time is uh, is running short, we've got about uh, two minutes left, but we're going to try to get through these questions. Uh, yes, uh, replay will be emailed out to folks, so we will do that. Um, do you have a recommendation on what corporation, what corp of, uh, uh, okay, I think I'm going to try to read this the best I can. Do you have a recommendation on which corporation or LLC would be best for a real estate agent in Minnesota selling about 20 to 25 units a year? Uh, with uh, about a $2 million gross purchase price with a goal of owning. Okay, you've got probably oh, sorry, two things Sorry, going on. sorry, oh, I didn't finish it. With okay. a goal of owning investment properties in the next one to three years, this will be the first LLC. Okay, if you're, you're actually talking about two different things, and what will probably wind up working better for you is either a series LLC that's got one arm that covers your real estate, you're, you're selling your real estate 
um, agent activities, uh, and if I'm understanding this right, I hope I am, you know, when you're buying and selling, you take somebody around the home, they buy it, you get a commission, that's active income. So that is subject to self-employment tax unless you put that income through the S corporation or the C corporation structure, get rid of that 15.3% and we can cut that probably about half in terms of your payroll tax. So if you're filing a Schedule C right now in your business, um, I would say, yeah, we'd want to put you into an LLC that makes an S corporation election for the properties that you intend to buy and hang on to for more than a year, and these will be your passive rentals, then I'd want to see those in an LLC that is making a passive election. So it would be reporting, um, if you're the only owner, it would be reporting on a Schedule E on your personal return. Okay, great. Uh, should we do one more question, Megan? All right, I got one more in me. <laughs> okay, and let me just say, uh, anybody, we didn't actually, I don't think, get through 100% of the questions, but Megan needs to jump off, and I, I want to respect her time and thank her so much for being here. Uh, if she did not get to your question, uh, you can email her your question, Megan at smartbusinessincorporation.com, uh, and she can answer it uh, uh, for you directly there. So I pro I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's, uh, but great questions and great involvement tonight. The last question of the night, uh, and then when you jump off the webinar again, please take two minutes and fill out that survey. Last question of the night. I currently have an investment home in California. I live in Montana. Should I put the California home in an LLC or a trust since the home is still financed? Um, you know, I think I'd put it into, you live in Montana, Missouri. Montana. Missouri or Montana? Montana. Montana. M-O-N. And the property is in California. You know, you've got a California tax burden any way you look at it. But in this case, I would be inclined, as long as you're the only owner and it's single member, I would be inclined to set up your LLC in Montana, um, drop the LLC into that. It's going to file, it's going to report its income and expenses on Schedule C to your personal return. And so that, you know, I think you've got the argument that it's not going to trigger a requirement to file in California. Fantastic. All right, Megan, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to everybody tonight, to give them the latest updates, uh, and to answer all of their questions. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, anybody else that has additional questions for Megan, follow-up questions, or you didn't get your question answered, you can just email her uh, here on the screen. And of course, everyone that's watching this on a recording, obviously you didn't get your questions answered, so feel free to email Megan directly uh, with those questions here. So. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Fill out that survey. Uh, it'll just be like a one- to two-minute uh, survey to give us your feedback when you jump off the webinar. And uh, Megan, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. I've enjoyed it. I hope that we gave everybody good info and, and you guys got what you came for. So. Absolutely. Thanks. Have a great night. All right. You bet. Bye-bye.